Hi, my name is Natalie McClutchy and this is McClutchy Maths. Today I'm going to be taking you through a flowchart in PowerPoint looking at all of the different concepts regarding simple interest, compound interest, annuities, perpetuities and reducing balance loans. And this is aimed at our senior year 12 students in Queensland, in Western Australia and any other states that are doing this kind of level of complex compound interest questions. Now this particular flowchart is available to you as a PowerPoint resource. All you need to do to get a hold of it is to contact me on McClutchyMaths at yahoo.com or to follow me on Facebook and request it in Facebook Messenger. So let's get started and have a look at the flowchart. So the starting point of our process is this green box that asks us the question, does the calculation use simple or compound interest? So any question that you're given related to finance, this is going to be the very first question that you're going to ask yourself. Am I using simple interest or compound interest? Now you'll see that in the question, it'll either say that something is compounded or it will say that it's using simple interest or potentially it may even say that it's adjusted fortnightly or adjusted monthly. And adjusted is another word that could be used for compounded. So as soon as you know that it's, it's simple interest, we're going to move over to here on the flowchart and we're going to use the simple interest formula, I equals PIN. And this is the formula that you'll find on your QCAA formula sheet if you're in Queensland. Now it's important to note that some of the variables on these formulas are right across all of the formulas. However, sometimes they mean different things depending on the context. In the case of simple interest, P is your principal, the little letter I represents your interest rate as a decimal. So you do need to convert that by dividing the rate by 100 before you use the formula. And N is always given for simple interest in a number of years. So for example, if you were told that it was for five and a half years, you're going to use N equals 5.5. On the other side, if you're told it's done for five months, you're going to do five divided by 12 and use that as a fraction of a year. Some people make the mistake of thinking that I is the number of periods, but it's not. It's the number of years in the simple interest formula. So that was a fairly easy one. We've been using simple interest since about grade eight. But what happens if it's compound interest? Well, firstly, we're going to ask ourselves one more question. Do we need to compare investments or loans? So sometimes you'll get a question where they'll give you a couple of different bank accounts. It might be two or even more, and you'll be potentially comparing them to one another. So if the answer is yes, you're going to ask yourself another question. Are you given a time period that the loan is going to last for? Now, if you are only comparing a rate and that's being invested against another rate, they may have different compounding periods, but essentially when you're comparing two rates with different compounding periods, you're not typically given a number of years. So if that's the case and you're not given the number of years, you're going to use the effective annual interest rate formula. Now in this case, it's very important to remember that I is the interest rate as a decimal and you do not change that to a rate per period. On all your other formulas, you have to change it to a rate per period first, but this is the exception. Do not do it on the effective interest rate formula because the formula does it for you. In this case, N is the number of compounding periods in one year because you're comparing two rates in a one year period. So if you use this formula, you'll be able to find out what that rate is and be able to make the effective choice. Now, if you're still comparing two loans, but you've got, for example, two different amounts of money being compared or different terms or different repayments, etc., you're now going to come over to the next question. And this will be the same question you'll ask even if you're not comparing investments and loans. And in this case, the question is, is there a regular recurring payment into um, an investment or a loan or out of an investment and loan. Now, if the answer for that is no, you're probably going to jump for joy because that just means you're going to use the compound interest formula. And you'll notice on this particular PowerPoint that I've got some little information there, CEX 7.2. Now, what that means there is that I'm actually using the Jacaranda textbook to map these particular formulas to particular questions. So if you've got access to the Jacaranda textbook, which my school uses, then you can find particular questions that match that. So I would suggest if you are actually getting hold of this particular resource from me that maybe if you're not using the Jacaranda textbook, you might decide to wipe that or, or delete that and map that to the textbook that you're using. Now you'll notice in this compound interest formula, you actually do need to change the interest rate to a rate per compounding period. 
which is the exception here. We don't do that on simple interest. We don't do that on the effective interest rate formula. N is the number of compounding periods in total, not just in one year. So that will be the number of years multiplied by the number of compounding periods per year. So that's the difference there, again, between the simple interest formula and the compound interest formula. Now, sadly for you, most of your um, complex questions or calculator questions in your exams are probably not going to be as straightforward as these ones that you see on your screen. They're probably going to be something more complex. So that means you're now going to move to the yes button here. We do have a regular recurring payment coming in or out of the investment or loan. And what that means, we're going to ask ourselves another question. Firstly, is it a perpetuity or is it a reducing balance loan or is it an annuity? Now you're crossing your fingers and hoping, oh please, let it be a perpetuity. And the way you'll know it's a perpetuity is one of two ways. Either A, you'll see the word perpetuity or perpetual in the question, or it'll be something straightforward like a million dollars was invested for a scholarship or a bursary fund, and the same payment was withdrawn each year at the same interest rate. So that tells you it's a perpetuity, in which case you're gonna use this formula. And in Queensland, you must memorize this formula. It's not on your QCAA formula sheet. Once again, this is the interest rate as a decimal. You do not change that into a rate per period. You need to memorize it. Okay, your other two options, these are the ones that you're probably holding your breath for and thinking, please, no, please, no. This is your reducing balance loan and your annuities. So with the reducing balance loan, I'm gonna take you to slide two, which takes you through a range of questions you're gonna ask yourself there. And if it's an annuity, we're gonna to go to slide three. So let's jump over now and pretend that we've answered the question and it's a reducing balance loan. So the next question you're gonna ask yourself, and you may be wondering why are some boxes green and why are some blue? Well, green is simply to tell you that's your starting position for each slide. So in this case with the reducing balance loan, you're asking yourself, have you been asked to use a recurrence relation? Now, if the answer is yes, then it's fairly straightforward. On your QCAA formula sheet, you've got the recurrence relation for a reducing balance loan. All you need to do is know what the different variables mean. Recall that R is one plus the interest rate as a decimal per compounding period. Capital R is the regular repayment. Now, if you haven't been asked to do a recurrence relation, then we're gonna move on to no. The next question is, have you been asked to use an amortization table, which is basically a tabulated form of the recurrence relation? And if the answer is yes, it's gonna look a little bit like this. You're gonna have your payment period, that's your value for N, your principal is your starting amount. The interest will be the principal multiplied by that rate per period. The repayment's gonna be the same in every, every different row. And then your balance formula is the principal plus the interest that's been charged by the bank, take away the repayment that you make periodically. And the next row for that, that balance will carry down to be in the underneath the principal column. Now, basically that amortization schedule is virtually identical to the recurrence relation. They're virtually doing the same thing. Um, it's just the recurrence relation set up in a table form. Now, if you haven't been asked to do a recurrence relation and you haven't been asked to do an amortization table, we're gonna move on. Now we're gonna be asking ourselves, okay, what variable of the loan do I need to find? And this is important because depending on what variable you want to find, you're gonna approach the reducing balance loan in different ways. Firstly, if you need to find the period or an amount owing after a certain number of months, say seven months, then you're gonna move back to your recurrence relation. That's a great way for you to quickly use your calculator to work out what that period is through the iterative function. And what I mean by that is, is you're gonna simply type the information onto your calculator, press the equals button over and over and over again until you get to the answer you need for the question. If the question's asking you, how long will it be before the loan is paid off? Or if it's asking you, um, how long until the loan is at $5,000? Or how, many, um, if it, how much will be owing after eight months, you can use this particular method. But there are other variables that you may need to find. The next one you may be asked to find is how much interest was repaid on this loan in total? Now, you need to basically for this, work out the number of repayments that you've had to make and then multiply that by each repayment's value because every repayment is made up of interest and principal. So each time you make a repayment on one of these loans, you're paying a bit off of what you borrowed 
and you're also paying off some interest as well. So if we work out how many repayments you make in total, multiply that by the actual amount of the repayment, it'll be a combination of what you borrowed plus all of the interest that you've earned. So now to find that interest, you can simply take away the principal from that total amount. So you can find two things out from this particular method. You can find out how much um, you had to pay back in total and how much interest had to be paid back in total. Lastly, you might be asked to find the repayment amount and the, or the amount initially borrowed. And in both of these cases, you're going to use the present value formula for an annuity. Now, you need to put your thinking hat on here. A reducing balance loan is a type of annuity because there is compounding that takes place and there is a regular, consistent repayment. So it does fit the, the model for an annuity. The reason why we use the present value formula is because we want to find out how much was borrowed in the present, not how much of the loan is going to be left in the future. So we need to backtrack with this. A is going to be that amount that we initially borrowed. M is going to be that recurring repayment. Now, unfortunately, if you don't like this formula, it's kind of tough luck. It's the only way that you can really find A or R. Now, we're going to move on to annuities. This is our final slide. So if we've decided and we've worked out that it's an annuity that's taking place, we need to ask ourselves if we have to use a recurrence relation. Typically, the question might say, model the annuity with a recurrence relation, in which case you're going to go straight to your formula sheet and use the formula that you've been given. As per the previous slide with the reducing balance loan, R is 1 plus the interest rate as a decimal per compounding period, and D is added on instead of taken off because it's that regular payment made by the investor. Now, if we're not asked to do that, we need to ask ourselves the next question. Are repayments being, or, sorry, are payments being added to the annuity or taken out of the annuity? Now, annuities can be one of two types. Firstly, it could be one that you're saving up towards something. So you might be putting $500 in an account every month for 20 years. In that case, you're adding payments to the annuity. There's other kinds. You might have saved a million dollars and that's your pension or your retirement money, and you're gonna be letting that continue to grow with interest, but you're gonna take a payment out to live on over time. So you've gotta ask yourself, am I adding money to it or am I taking money out of that annuity? Now, if I'm taking money out of that annuity, effectively, I can't use the recurrence relation for an annuity. I've gotta treat it like it's a reducing balance loan because of the same principles taking place. Even though this time, interest is being paid to me and not to the bank, then the repayment is coming to me and not to the bank. It still follows that model for a recurrence relation of a reducing balance loan. So in that case, I'm gonna treat the amount that I've originally invested as the amount that I've borrowed, and that R is gonna be my regular payment made to me, the investor. Now, if I'm actually adding payments to the annuity, I'm gonna come over here and ask myself my next question. Have I been asked specifically to find the future value or the present value. Now you're hoping, please tell me, please tell me if it's future or, pre or present. Please don't make me guess. And I'm, I'm in the same way sometimes. Some of those questions can be a bit ambiguous. So if you're actually told, yes, this is future value, well then you're gonna shout for joy because you just go straight to the QCAA formula sheet and you can use the future value formula, which is the first one on the sheet. And then if you're told it's present value, well, you're gonna jump straight onto that formula sheet again and you're gonna use the present value that's on the formula sheet there. And I've mapped some exercises from the Jacaranda textbook to these particular formulas. Now, there's also situations where you go, I'm not sure, I really don't know what I'm being asked to find here. In which case you're gonna ask yourself, what kind of variable of the annuity am I trying to find? Now, if I'm trying to find the amount that's available after a certain number of years, so let's say I'm investing $1,000 every year for 20 years and I wanna find how much I have at the end. Well, that's fairly straightforward. I need to find the future value. Alternatively, if I wanna find what that regular amount of money is that I need to deposit to deliver a million dollars in 20 years time, I'm gonna also use the future value formula and I'm trying to find M in that case. Now, if I wanted to find the equivalent amount I would have to invest as a non-annuity, that means just a straightforward compound interest investment, I'm gonna use the present value because what that does is it will take that um, future value and discount it back to an equivalent amount. 
Now, if I need to find the period that I can do that one of two ways. Firstly, to find the period, I could use the recurrence relation on my calculator and use that iterative function. Alternatively, you'll notice that this with one particularly branches off with two arrows back to the annuity formula. I could use the iterative function there by rearranging the formula and making one plus i to the power of n the subject of the equation. Now, if you're not great with algebra, I would probably recommend to use the recurrence relation. But if your algebra is fairly strong and you're fairly good at transposing equations, then you're probably going to be okay using the future value annuity formula. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you would like a copy of this flowchart, once again, please don't hesitate to contact me at mcclutchymass at yahoo.com or to message me on Facebook Messenger. We're, follow us on Facebook. We're called McClutchy Mass there as well. Now, the best way to utilise this particular PowerPoint is to do it one of two ways. I would highly recommend that you print it in colour. Have it as a little cheat sheet next to your exercises, but I would highly recommend you just get in that pattern of asking yourself questions. Every time that you see an annuity or a loan or an investment style question, just have an idea of the flow chart in your head. What questions are you going to ask yourself? The questions do become a little bit repetitive after time, so you will get used to saying to yourself, is this simple or is it compound? Is there a regular payment? What variable do I need to find? You can follow that process. And the more you practice with exercises and questions, the better you'll be at using the flowchart without looking at it. I would also highly recommend, after you've printed it in colour, that you also try and put it on your screen in animation mode. So that means presenter mode where it's full screen and you can use the animations and press the page down button as you go and that way that flowchart will build slowly and not be as overwhelming for you to look at. Have a great day.